Um, well, I, I'm excited uh, for this morning's text um, for a few different reasons, but I did want to share some just brief good news about the campus ministry. Uh, we're quickly coming upon finals week, and we just had our, well, I say first ever. It's the first time we've done it since we've been here, so I'm sure it's happened before. Uh, but our first ever campus, singles, yo pro, married, kind of joint Friday night live slash devotional on Friday night, and it was just spectacular. Um, it was amazing kind of coming together in this, I say innocent fun, it probably wasn't very innocent. Um, people were pile driving each other. There's sand that was eaten on the beach. We played a game called Cubbity and uh, had a blast together, but it really was like a slice of heaven. Uh, having the sunset behind us, worshiping together and having fun together. So um, yeah, it was just a special, special time. But on top of that, our campus ministry is 19 students. Well, currently we have 19 friends studying the Bible right now, which is amazing, amazing stuff to, to see people uh, growing in their faith, uh, falling in love with Jesus and making some really, really big decisions to make him Lord of their life. But uh, for the campus students, the next two weeks are going to be grueling. Finals are quickly approaching and in many ways I do not envy them and I'm sure neither do you. Um, even as I was thinking about this sermon, I was thinking back to my days in college. I remember my first college exam at the University of Kentucky, and it did not go well. I wasn't a Christian, mind you, so please do not imitate me. Um, I didn't go to class for the first six weeks in college. I was like, my parents aren't here. Like, we're going to be fine. I'll read the textbook. I'll look at the notes. I go in. It was a mechanical engineering exam. Um, it was, it was all, it, it really wasn't, it was just like definitions. It wasn't even engineering. I, maybe that's an excuse, but I, I, either way, it was, um, it was a class on manufacturing. And it was all these terms about manufacturing. And I was like, I'm not going to go to class and just sit here and listen to some old boring guy talk. And so I studied my notes. I went into the exam. I opened the exam and I instantly in my head go, uh oh. Uh, you, you know, like, it, maybe it was like the SET for you, or maybe it was something, maybe it was a, uh, an English paper, but the moment you open that exam, you know I'm in trouble. And I knew almost in that moment that I was going to have to drop that class, and there isn't good news to the story. I did drop the class because I got an F on the exam. But there are also moments in college, uh, the, the other class was a thermodynamics class, I studied hard at this time. I'm a junior. I'm actually studying the Bible, or it's my senior year. I'm studying the Bible at this time, so I'm starting to develop conviction about integrity and work ethic and not cheating, though I still had a long way to go even at that time. Uh, but I go into my mechanical, for my thermodynamics exam, and I felt really, really prepared. And I, and I open up the test, and I again go, uh-oh. And it's like the most deflating feeling in the world. Like you feel like you're ready, you're coming into this exam, and you know, like even before you start working on it, even before you turn it in, like you don't have a hope. Like, yes, I believe in Jesus, but I don't have a chance here. Well, this morning, you and I are going to take an exam together. And the exam is one question. And the question appears very easy and very straightforward. But the question must be explained. It's not a yes or no answer. It's something that you have to elaborate on. And the question is this. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? And I think in order to answer this question... We have to recognize what the question is not. The question is not, did you come to church? The question is not, does your grandmother love Jesus? The question is not, do you read your Bible? The question is not, what fellowship are you a part of? The question is, do you love Jesus? Jesus. And I think, and, and actually this text is going to help us quite a bit this morning answer this question. I think in order for us to answer this question, there's kind of some sub-questions that we have to wrestle with and explain ourselves on whether or not we love 
Jesus. And so I ask again, do you love Jesus? And if so, what does that mean? You see, I think if we love Jesus, and actually I know if we love Jesus, it's going to be multifaceted. First and foremost, we're going to want to spend time with who? With Jesus. I remember being enamored with my wife when I first met her at Beachstock almost eight, nine years ago. And you better bet I wanted to spend time with her. I, I heard her story. She was hair on fire for Jesus. She was refined in her faith. She was very, very beautiful as well, which helped. But, but I was like, oh my gosh, I want to spend time with Catherine Rose Woodham. If, if we're going to say we love Jesus, do you want to spend time with Jesus? Is coming, is coming to the body a burden or a joy? Is diving into Jesus' word something that you view as legalistic or something that you're like, I get to do it? You know what? I still use the term quiet time in my vernacular. I know it's a bit strange, but I get to spend time with Jesus. And I get to look at my son and say, son, right now I can't play. I can't hang out because I'm having my quiet time with Jesus. In our, in our time with Jesus, when, when we're hanging out with Jesus, man, are we growing in our knowledge of Jesus? Man, my, my, my perception, my, my understanding of who Christ was, who Christ is when I got baptized, hopefully has grown seven years later. In order for us to be able to say yes to the question, do I love Jesus, our knowledge for Jesus must be growing. And then the last one's a little bit weird. Are we obeying Jesus? And the reason that one's weird, I promise we're going to get in the text. The reason that one's weird is that does not correlate with our relationships here on earth. Right? If somebody looks at you and says, hey, Jimmy, do you love Catherine? And I say, yes, I obey her. You're going to look at me and be like, there's something wrong in that dynamic. Right? If you come to me and you're like, hey, I think I love my wife. And my first question is, hey, are you obeying your wife? You're going to be like, well, that's not really a good question. Even the word obey comes with these feelings of, uh, of uh, dictatorship and domineering and, 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 and overly uh, authoritarian. But, but there's something different about Jesus than it is us. And so if we're going to say yes to the question, do we love Jesus, it's going to be three, three parts. We're going to want to spend time with him. We're going to be growing in our knowledge of him. And we will be obeying him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I start looking at that, I'm like, I'm a C at best. Maybe a D. Actually, definitely a D. I struggled this week in my obedience, right? I have a hard time figuring out when I'm supposed to be a professional preacher and a faithful follower. Well, the answer to that question is always the latter. But, but I wrestle, right? And so what's so special about this text is that if you and I choose to love Jesus, the Holy Spirit will only increase our intimacy with him. If you and I choose to love Jesus, the Holy Spirit will only increase our intimacy with him. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Look with me down in verse 15. We are kind of continuing our our theme on the Holy Spirit for the rest of the month of April. I almost said June, which is crazy. We've got a long way to go till June. But, uh, so we're, we're diving into this idea of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus' own words, he says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you. And be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you all know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me any longer. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father. And you all are in me. And I am in you all. 
Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. But all this I have spoken while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. It's not about new revelations in the Holy Spirit. It's about reminding us of the things Jesus has already said. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You've heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens. So when it does happen, you all will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. And, and it is a pretty uh, inspiring text, but it is kind of a bit of a concerning text because Jesus, he's starting off in this paragraph, right? This is right after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. It's right after he says, hey, I'm going to prepare a room for you in my father's house as many rooms. And then the the amazing passage in John 14, 12, that man, you you disciples are going to do greater things than Jesus himself, right? And so it's these incredible indicative statements about what Jesus is going to do for his disciples, And then he comes to this if statement. If you love me. If you love me. And and I love what's going on here. And and even what Dr. Perkins shared last weekend, the Holy Spirit is not a force, but is fully God. Or, Or put another way, the Holy Spirit will never force you or I to do anything. And so Jesus, coming back to his disciples, he says, if you love me, Love, brothers and sisters, it's so much more than euphoria or desire or emotions, right? If it were that, I fall in and love with in and out of love every day with my spouse and my children. Love, it can't be that, right? Love in the eyes of scriptures and by the author of love is something that you and I always get to choose. And so Jesus says, okay, if you choose to love me, Here's what's going to happen. The first thing he says is you're going to obey me. And we're going to come back there. But there is an important note because that's going to kind of be where we finish this morning. If you were to go back and read this text on your own, notice how love and obedience are tethered together in this passage. It's like they can't be inseparated when it comes to our faith in Jesus. And, and so he's like, okay, if you, if you love me, you will obey me. And we'll, we'll get there in, in a second. But, but then he starts talking about this advocate. And the Greek word for advocate, the, the advocate to help you, it's parakaleto. Or, uh, I'm sorry, parakaletas. Parakaletas. And it's actually a rather difficult term to translate. I think our older NIVs translate it as counselor. Uh, some translate it as kind of a capital A advocate or helper, it's, it's translated in many different ways. What the Holy Spirit is not is a camp counselor. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is also not a marriage counselor. The Holy Spirit is a helper that will increase our intimacy with Jesus. Do you remember when you studied the Bible? You started like realizing, oh my gosh, Jesus is real. And then you realized all the ramifications of that reality. And you thought to yourself, how on earth am I ever supposed to do this Christian thing? Maybe I'm, I, I did my sin study and I laughed in the guy's face. I said, you don't know me. I can never stop doing these things. 
But, but the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying, hey, if you love me, keep my commandments and I'm sending the Holy Spirit for you to be a helper, to be an advocate, to be a, a legal counselor. And what, this, what is this Holy Spirit going to do? It's going to bring us intimately closer with Jesus. This is such a special point, brothers and sisters, but, but it is a point that I think we, we better have some real sobriety to us as we answer the question, do I love Jesus? If we're not willing to spend time with the Spirit now, why on earth would we want to spend eternity with Jesus tomorrow? If in our free time, we're quicker to pick up our phones to distract us from the realities of this world or to indoctrinate us to them, rather than spending time with Jesus, there's probably some question marks around the question, do I love Jesus? If reading our Bibles has become uh, a burden, right? And I'm not, I'm a minister. I don't always wake up eager to read my Bible. That's crazy, right? But I'm also a father. I don't wake up always eager to be a father. But, but, but if, if reading my Bible, spending time with Jesus is, is something burdensome to me, man, there's something, there's some sort of disconnect between me and the Holy Spirit, but, but, but here's what I believe, and this is just my opinion. What I believe is the greatest obstacle between us spending time in the Spirit, us spending time intimately close with Jesus, living in communion with Jesus today, and it's simply being distracted. Dallas Willard was quoted back in the late 1990s. Uh, I guess I should read it so I don't misquote him. This is what Dallas Willard was quoted in the late 90s. He said, hurry is the greatest enemy of spiritual life in our day. And you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry in your life. That was the 1990s. <laughs> it must be infinitely worse today. Right? The 1990s, the internet was still dialing up on our computers. And anybody under the age of 30, you have no idea what I just said. You couldn't make a phone call and be on the internet at the same time. If you're like AIMing and then your dad picked up the phone to make a business call, you like yell, Dad, I'm on the computer! That was 20 years, 30 years ago, I don't know. Right now, we are so distracted by so many things that if we're honest, are often just selfish. And if you and I, man, if we're going to be in love with Jesus, if we're going to allow his spirit to take us intimately close with him, we've got to figure out how to ruthlessly eliminate the distractions in our life. If you're too busy to pray, figure out a way to pray. If church is too much of a burden for us, man, we've got to relook at our schedules and figure out how can I spend time with the body? Because church, let's be honest, we can't have the head without the body, can we? The Holy Spirit wants to bring us intimately close with Jesus, right? He, he wants to be in us. He wants to live with us. That, that's what he's talking about. Man, it's better that I go because I'm going to have to die on the cross and it's going to look bleak and ugly and terrible. And, and honestly, I could have listened to Lynn like for another two hours. I felt like I was listening to Audible this morning and it was like so soothing. But, but, but even as she was sharing about the hope that we have in Jesus, right, and he wants to live in us. You talk about intimacy. That's like the hope, the gospel, the good news, the grace of God. That you don't have to do this on your own. That, that he doesn't give the way the world gives. Hey, here you go. Just figure out. No, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to advocate for you. But as all this is happening, he's going to help us grow in our knowledge of him. And, and that's what he's talking about down in, in verse 25, right? All this I've spoken to you while I was still with you. But the advocate, that, that's the parakletos, the, the Holy Spirit, whom God will send in my name to, to come after the resurrection in Acts chapter 2, he will teach you these things and remind you of everything I have said to you. I loved so much of what Brian Perkins shared last weekend. And I also loved the audacity of the church to like, shamelessly recruit him and Shan to live out here. That was pretty cool. Never seen that before. Hopefully it works. I don't know if that was a good strategy or not. 
Um, but, but, but what Brian reiterated to us time and time again is the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't necessarily giving us new revelations. The Holy Spirit is reminding us of the teachings and life and expectations of Jesus. Right? It, it is the, the road to Emmaus, right? As, as Jesus is talking to them and the Holy Spirit kind of opens their eyes and like, oh my gosh, was not my heart burning inside of me as Jesus shared these things. Right? It, it's the Christian that when you go out in the world and, and, and you start to, to go somewhere that you shouldn't be going and then you just feel the burn of the Holy Spirit. I, I remember so distinctively, I, my parents invited me on a cruise. I was a really, really young Christian. And I probably should have gotten advice about it. I didn't. I went on this carnival cruise. I call it a sin cruise. I mean, I'm not saying they're all like this, but this, it was wild. Like, like there are dads throwing their, their daughter's undergarments at, at my brother. Like, it was crazy, right? And I remember being on that cruise and having scriptures just beating my mind and, and like pleading with me to hold on. I remember first uh, John chapter two, right? If you love the world or anything in the world, love for the Father is not in you. And, and like it burning its way into my heart. That's what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Or that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. Remind us of the truths in scripture, but, but we can't do it if we're distracted all the time. And so back, back to that question, do you love Jesus? Are you growing in your knowledge of Jesus? Or did your knowledge of Jesus stop in the 80s? Did your love of Jesus halt pre-COVID? These are things that, man, the examination is not just we passed a year ago. It's an examination we, we've got to come back to today. But, but then we, we come to this whole tethered idea, right? And, and we, we talked briefly about the difference between loving Jesus and loving people in this world. Right? The, Jesus, the reason Jesus wants us to obey him is he's the king of the universe. But, but he's not a king who's just domineering and a dictator and wants to oppress us. It's not that at all. He's a king who's infinitely be better than any other king. And his expectation of obedience is intimately connected with his love for you and I. He wants us to obey him because it's for our benefit and it's for the benefit of those around us. And, and, and the Holy Spirit, what, what's so special about this passage, it's all about the Holy Spirit taking us into greater obedience to Jesus. That man, if you choose to love him, despite the, the, the fears, the anxieties, the insecurities, if you say, no, Jesus, I'm going to love you and I'm going to fight to obey you, the Holy Spirit is going to help you. I remember uh, I was studying the Bible with this guy named Josh back in Lexington, Kentucky, and we were talking about evangelism, right? And I was like, hey, Josh, we're going to go share our faith. And he's like, oh, I can't do it. I was like, Josh, we got to. Jesus, he just expects it of us. Let's just go try, right? So we go sharing for 30 minutes. Josh doesn't open up his, his mouth once, not, not once. And I'm like, at this point, I'm, I'm almost begging him, right? I'm like, I kind of got to go, like, we just get this over with. Like, I just think it's something we should do. Well, finally, Josh's like, I'm just going to do it. Right? He goes up to this guy named Landon. Hey, hey, and, and it's, there's nothing like cute about it. There's nothing charismatic about it. He goes up to Landon and, and rather really awkwardly, and, and I got second, maybe, yeah, I got secondhand embarrassment. He said, hey, do you want to study the Bible? And I'm like, what? I guess not what I did at all this entire time. <laughs> right? Bam! Comes the Holy Spirit. Landon studies the Bible, gets baptized a couple weeks later. And I was like, okay, not about Jimmy's methods. Let's just unleash the Holy Spirit. What's so special about this idea, brothers and sisters, is we cannot remove the second half of John chapter 14 from the first half of John chapter 14. Right, John 14, 12 to 14 is one of my favorite promises in all the Bible. That you and I, not only will we do the works that Jesus has been doing, but we'll do what? Even greater things than Jesus. What happened with these disciples? The Holy Spirit didn't limit them to the region of Galilee. The Holy Spirit took them all throughout Rome. The Holy Spirit did not limit them to people of Jewish descent. 
but took them to the pagans and the Gentiles of all nations. The Holy Spirit didn't limit them to 120 faithful followers at the, the death of Jesus, but unleashed them to 3,000 baptized and baptisms at the beginning of the church. Like the Holy Spirit wants to unleash an incredible power in you and in me. If only we would choose to obey. To say, man, despite my fears, despite my insecurities, despite my inadequacies, inadequacies, Jesus, I'm going to choose to obey you. I'm going to confess my sin even though I don't want to. I'm going to open up my mouth even though I'm afraid. I'm going to be a man or woman of integrity at the workplace even though everybody else is cutting corners. Oh yeah, it's tax season tomorrow. I'm going to do those with integrity as well. It's, it's the students, right, that, man, Jesus, I know everybody's using chat GPT to write their papers, but I, I, I refuse to. Even if I get a C, I'm going to surrender and submit to being a man or woman of my word. Man, in my marriage, I'm going to choose to lay down my life for my wife, even though she's disrespecting me, because I know, Jesus, that's what you did for me, and that's what you expect me to do of her, do to her. Man, I'm going to set up time to pray and fast. And, and I, I don't know, right? I'm not the Holy Spirit. But, but even the things that I'm saying, like pale in comparison to what Jesus and his spirit want to do in us. Like forget about, oh man, if only we could go back to pre-COVID or if only like the young people knew what it was like to be a Christian in the 80s or 90s. Stop it! Like, no, it's so much greater. If only you and I would choose to love Jesus today. And then choose to love him again tomorrow. Praise God for his grace. Praise God, as I've shared, some of you are like, man, I, I'm, not, I'm not even getting a D on this exam. Well, this is part of God's grace, is exposing us and and Jesus is going to talk about it in John 15, 16, that, that the same parakalitas is going to expose and convict the world of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If, if only you and I would, would choose. It's not about being perfect, church. It's not even remotely about being perfect. It's about, man, am I going to choose to love Jesus? And may that be true of the Hampton Roads Church. Despite whatever comes in the presidential election, Despite the ever-changing technology, d- despite the overwhelming temptations to be distracted, that we together choose to love Jesus. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we grow in our intimacy with him, our knowledge of him, and ultimately our obedience to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the God of gods. Thank you so much.